Welcome to Art 385. This week we have a very interesting movie for you to watch. Sorry, I get carried away with myself. Uh, but actually this week is uh, going to be a very interesting week when it comes to the movie we get to watch, Nosferatu. Um, it's a German film, um, 1922, I believe, a silent movie. Nice thing is the version you'll watch on Netflix actually has the English translation um, when it comes to titles. Uh, it is a silent movie, so it doesn't really matter what they're saying. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow it uh, a little better. Um, Nosferatu. Possibly the first feature-length vampire movie. Now, this day and age, vampires are a dime a dozen. Um, everything from Twilight to, uh, you know, um, scary movies have vampires in them. Um, but uh, back in the day, it was still somewhat of a, a novelty. Um, it's loosely based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. I say loosely because it doesn't follow the story directly, but it's definitely inspired by it. Um, and it does precede um, what uh, we would consider the Dracula movies of the 1930s starring Bela Lugosi. And um, you'll see that the vampire in this movie is unlike any vampire you have probably seen before. Uh, in fact, I believe uh, our discussion and journal... Um, I believe it's the discussion I have you kind of talk about the major difference that we see uh, in this vampire compared to the other more beautiful vampires that we're used to seeing this day and age. Um, you also will find that as you watch the movie, it might be something, even though it's a bit of a, of a horror movie, um, more in the old school horror sense than the modern kind of gruesome cut em up. Um, sort of horror movie, but suspense and, um, you know, some scary moments, you probably won't jump because it's in black and white and it's silent and so forth. But um, I think you're going to find this movie interesting and perhaps entertaining um, because it is more of a traditional narrative in the sense that we have a protagonist, an antagonist, we've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and it flows uh, uh, very much that way, what we're used to reading in a novel or watching in a modern movie. So uh, unlike some of our um, existential films that we've seen this, uh, this semester, and many people have gone, I don't understand these movies, uh, this one you should be able to follow the story fairly well, and I hope even be entertained by it. Um, now, our lovely book here. I've received nice emails about this book. Um, <laughs> and I might agree with a lot of the emails, too. Um, there's a lot of good information in here. I'm, I'm learning, uh, even though I went to film school and I've taught the subject for a while now, I'm learning some new aspects. So I'm glad that I have this book and that I am uh, uh, kind of... Uh, that we're working through it together in that regard. Um, but I think we will all admit there are times when she writes sentences uh, that are, as I explained to my wife um, this afternoon, there are times when I feel like I have a pickaxe banging up against a concrete road. Uh, it just, it's hard to, to read. It's not something that's easy. Um, unlike other books that I've chosen for other classes that uh, deal with the, the art, but also in a way that we can understand, um, she she you know doesn't have that. I, I I personally believe this probably is her dissertation, uh, and so she was impressing her um, her uh, advisors and so forth. Um, anyways. Uh, I want I want to encourage you though to bear with it. Um, I don't mean to mock the material that is in here because it's some very good. Um, there's some very good things to learn here, particularly when we think about Nosferatu uh, and its style and the way the movie is made. It is very much influenced by the movement of its day, the German um, expressionist uh, movement. Uh, and also, as we look at some of the art that she presents in here, and I, I put a couple of the um, paintings uh, from Frederick um, 
online for you to look at of Caspar Frederick um, in color, you can see even how the Romantic movie, movement influenced the uh, Expressionist movement here and so forth. So, I mean, that aspect of it is, is worthwhile to look at. Um, but I encourage you, um, work through, particularly, um, I feel like in her introduction, uh, the first uh, two or three pages, um, it takes a little while for us to get going where we need to be going. Um, uh, by about page 164, 165, we start to see, particularly 165 down towards the, the middle there, she starts talking about how um, Murnau's, uh, the director's intellectual oscillation between, between romantic painting and expressionist art explains the rich range of Nosferatu's actual visual source and potential intertextual references, um, she at least cites right there where she's going with this. We're going to be looking at romantic and expressionistic painting. And actually, she ends up spending um, most of the time talking about romantic paintings. Um, also, a couple things I wanted to point out as, we, as then she develops that idea over the next couple pages is by page 175, when she talks, uh, 175, I'm sorry, it's late, page 171, when she's talking about uh, Murnau and um, Friedrich, Caspar Friedrich's The Painting as Desire. Um, read through what she's talking there, but let me give you some um, guide guideposts here to look at. Uh, she talks about several visual aspects here, um, and if I was teaching more of a film um, production class, I, I would say look at what she talks about in regards to landscape, how landscape... Um, um, works, how scale and the contrast between scale, large and and, and small works. Uh, she continues on and then talks about high angle shots. A little later she talks about low angle shots um, and how this is almost a yearning for the divine. She reads into that some. Uh, we could argue yes or no, but um, she also then talks about editing. The idea that uh, on the towards the bottom of page 175 she says Thus, Nosferatu's long nails bring together the notion that the vampire is a creature born out of the darkness of nature, the image of the oriental despot and the elongated lines of Gothic architecture. Sorry, I read the wrong quote, but that's still a good quote. I underlined it. Um, <laughs> it's very much a, a big argument within um, film studies how something that looks different, something of of an eastern oriental um, 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 origins, and particularly our vampire, and this one has some of those Eastern features, um, we in the West uh, cry foreign, different, strange, I don't understand it. Anyways, uh, I digress there. What I was looking at there on the bottom of page 175 is Murnau's alternate shots of Ellen sitting by the sea with shots of silver waves rushing towards the shores. Um, she, talks, he, she talks a lot about... Um, his kind of almost montage editing style of uh, cutting back and forth. There's particularly the famous scene there where Ellen knows something's going on back home in Germany. Um, she's in her bed and she awakens, and then we cut back to Transylvania when the vampire is upon um, Hooter and is about ready to get him. And there's this back and forth uh, over. A, you know, a thousand miles or so. I don't know how far Germany is from Transylvania. It's probably only 800 miles, 500 miles. I don't know. Anyways, um, but there's this telepathic moment there. And the editing, uh, the, the, the use of editing helps tell the story. I think it's very important to point that out. Um, and then she also talks about, continuing in that section, um, the lighting. Um, and she will refer to lighting um, a little later on, too, with this... Um, and I, I always have a horrible time pronouncing this word, but it's a chiaroscuro, uh, or a chi, uh, chiaroscuro lighting. Um, and I have for years tried to get that right, but you know the idea is the contrast of of light and and dark, um, creating very dramatic shadows. Um, uh, we see that use um, in the film here. So. I think I mentioned earlier that when I have taught this class before that I looked at some of the big main elements. We looked at mezzanine, which is often the set, the costumes, the actors' movements, um, a couple other uh, main items there, um, um, lighting. 
Um, also, cinematography is another big aspect. Composition, uh, how uh, high and low angles, how uh, the subjects are arranged within the view of the camera. Um, and, and then we've also talked about art direction, um, uh, editing, sound. So, in a sense, she touches on a lot of these elements here between page 171 and um, uh, roughly um, about 178 there. Um, but as you read through it, sometimes it's hard to, to grasp that. But I wanted to point those out to you because I know at the beginning we talked about film techniques. So, once again, she's kind of talking about some techniques here, and I wanted to draw those out for you. Um, and then, um, obviously, continuing on, she looks at... Um, Really, the latter part, she looks. Um, she does do a comparison between um, romantic and expressionistic uh, actual paintings, and then the latter part, for me, I feel is uh, perhaps the the weakest part. She um, she dives into some speculative uh, thinking and um, considerations about, uh, as she put it, I'm trying to find here my underline here. Um, the idea of uh, the way the characters, the vampire particularly, um, and Hooter is are, are framed with round arches that, uh, this is on the bottom of page 189, the round arches suggest um, instead the curving line of the female womb and convey a longing for the mother's body or for lost feminine origin. And then she talks about homoeroticism and uh, other sort of issues in that regard. Now, if you're interested in film studies, um, uh, you will come across this from time to time. People really trying to read into things that are difficult to say whether they're there or not. Um, I, I've, said, I've seen on several sources that uh, um, our director here, um, uh, Murnau or Manu, um, possibly was a homosexual himself. Uh, but I don't think you watching this movie without any context... Let's say you just picked up on Netflix and, hey, this is the, one of the first vampire movies. I want to watch it. I don't think you would pick up um, on those subjects without somebody actually pointing them out to you. And so uh, that aspect, I would say, is up for debate. And it's it I would say it is subjective. Um, I mean, there are arguments made for vampires, a male vampire, going after a, a male victim. Um, but I think often in the storyline, um, it's it's all about blood. It's not about uh, something sexual in nature. Now, some could say it's implied, as she does. It's all about Freud and so forth. Uh, that, I, I think, is a whole other subject to discuss because today what we're looking at is film as visual art. So uh, you can take that with a grain of salt at the end because I am too. Um, um, but nonetheless, she does point out a lot of uh, uh, many, many great points here for us to consider and for us to compare. So... Um, what I'd like to try to do in just the next few minutes, very quickly, I don't want this to be long, is talk just a little bit and maybe just establish a bit of, about romanticism and, and expressionism. Um, I am not uh, an, an art history major in any regards. Uh, I, I have a cursory understanding of this information, uh, but I just wanted to kind of set the tone for you. I think all that you need to respond and write is to read what she has, watch this lecture, and um, um, and watch the movie, and I think you're going to be fine. But let me just give you a bit of a background. We kind of spoke a little bit about romanticism back with the um, uh, the the German film, The Marquis of O, a couple weeks ago. Uh, particularly, um, you could look at a hundred year spectrum, 1770 to 1870, as a movement. Um, the height, uh, the the beginning to the height would have definitely been late 18th century on into early to middle um, 19th century. It was definitely waning by, you know, 1870. But the reason they give the 100-year span is that uh, you've got a beginning, uh, it's apex, and then the end. and that, that It has influence on either end there with the height of it really being around the turn of the century there um, in the 18th early 1800s. Um, but the idea of romanticism, and I, I, I looked at several sources to kind of put together a, a definition for you, uh, is to look, is to really um, uh, look at imagination over reason. 
And uh, what we mean here is that we're moving out of the age of enlightenment, uh, the age of reason, where the universe is looked at as a machine that was set in order by God and is working like clockwork. Uh, and in that regard, everything is that way. The solar systems, uh, our earth, our, our uh, bodies, and so forth, are all these mechanisms. And so we can rationally, with reason, look at things, observe them, break them down, and see them work in that regard. And so what the Romantics really were trying to do, or were kind of... Uh, move away from just reason and actually elevate imagination or creativity above that as the supreme faculty of the mind. It's not the re uh, our reasoning capabilities. It is our capability to create um, that is the most important aspect of who we are as human beings. And so the Romantics tended to define and to present uh, the imagination as our ultimate shaping or creative power uh, and the and it is the approximate human equivalent of the creative powers of nature or even divinity in that regard um, or deity uh, in that regard um, now what's interesting about this is that I think most Christians would say uh, this is a, a wonderful aspect uh, of uh, who we are as human beings uh, created in the image of God we both have reason and creativity. And in that regard, we uh, strike out and we create. Um, and in that regard, we're emulating um, God um, because we are created in the image of God. And thus, uh, this I don't want this to sound blasphemous in any ways, we are, if you will, many creators. I'm not at all putting us on a level of divinity, but because we are, in a sense, given charge to subdue creation uh, and to go and cultivate um, in that regard, cultivate is to create, um, whether that's on the level of creating societies and kingdoms and cities, um, or actually creating art. Um, the, we have that component. But I think what the Romantics were doing, we're definitely trying to separate from a Christian worldview um, and, a, and perhaps a deist understanding, or definitely moving maybe even towards a, an agnostic sort of understanding that we don't know anything about our creator or divinity. Um, and uh, in that regard, uh, reason we're going to set aside and we're going to look at um, um, imagination and creativity as the apex of what it is to be a human. Uh, romantics displaced the rationalistic view of the universe as a machine uh, with the uh, analog of an organic uh, image or, uh, you know, looking at nature um, as something... Uh, 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 creative and uh, so in that regards nature symbolism myths are are very uh, important to look at um, sorry I don't know if you guys can hear that there my cat is back there scratching at something um, so in that regards uh, it, it, uh, moving towards um, expressionism uh, a lot of uh, expressionists um, uh, uh, like the idea of creativity um, being um, uh, important um, and the idea of, of cultivating creativity but uh, very much like the, um, uh, the, uh, the French films uh, The New Wave that we looked at the expressionist also wanted to strike out and, and do away with form um, and convention and, and, and really uh, deal with um, if you will um, who they were at the core at the core pardon me L let me read let me read you this quote here um, unlike this is from German expressionist.com unlike uh, in impressionism uh, the ex the expressionist artist goal so the goal of an expressionist is not to reproduce the impression suggested by the surrounding world but instead to depict his or her own interpretation of the event or the object. So you can see it's very much from the artist point of view. This is what I see uh, and I want you to experience what I see or what I am feeling. Uh, and jo uh, Joseph Minton uh, says that the expressionist artist displays an intentionalized depiction of reality and allows their personal and potential biased emotions to impact that depiction. It is an art form that comes from the artist's point of view. It is the one art form that truly allows the viewer to both see and feel the world through the eyes of the artist. Um, and so uh, this um, 
And, and I think uh, Del Vecchi tries to connect the, the romantic movement uh, moving into expressionism. Uh, but at the core, this artistic movement, uh, and I'm calling German expressionism because we're looking at a German movie, particularly German and England were very influenced by this expressionist movement, which had its beginnings, its uh, origins in the late 19th century, but particularly uh, bloomed in the early 20th century um, and uh, was squashed pretty much by World War II. Um, because Nazis didn't really like art that much, or at least uh, expressionistic art. Um, but uh, an artistic, uh, the, the, as an artistic movement, uh, it did encompass everything from theater, painting, uh, forms of literature, and film. And particularly today as we look at it, um, the argument can be made that uh, Nosferatu is a German expressionist film. Now, our director, um, F.W. Uh, Moreau, will, um, it, just in a couple years later, in his movie Faust, really develop this, uh, this uh, uh, um, um, expressionistic point of view. Um, but nonetheless, um, we do see elements of that today. Now, what, what is it that makes a film, a particularly a German film, e expressionistic? What are some of the qualities? Well, there are a few that I'll point out that you can look for as you watch the movie. Uh, but as I said earlier, the uh, uh, chiaroscuro lighting, which literally is lighting that shows extreme contrast of light and dark, uh, creating these very dramatic shadows. You're going to see that in this movie. Um, a, a preoccupation with mirrors, glass, and other reflective surfaces. Uh, definitely towards the end, you're going to see the vampire. Actually, you'll see his reflection, which kind of goes against uh, the uh, myth of the vampire. Um, but you'll also see some other elements of that in this, in this particular movie. Uh, the use of uh, anthropomorphism. Um, an attribution of human form, human characteristics, human behaviors on non-human things. Uh, there's actually a mention of a werewolf here early on. Um, the use of negative photography and other optical tricks. We do see forms of optical tricks, particularly the vampire dissolving uh, or uh, fading in and out of uh, the world, uh, disappearing and revealing himself. Uh, and an interest... A, a, an abnormal interest in abstractionism, uh, which would be the style of art that um, internal form over pictorial represented, just very abstract styles. Now, in this movie, you don't get, uh, uh, there isn't a, as much of an extreme um, abstract sort of um, look uh, in that regard, but um, if you watch a movie, it's, maybe you've seen... Um, uh, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, uh, you will see this kind of abstract sort of expressionistic view. If you've ever seen Fritz Lang's Metropolis, there's another great example of a German expressionist film. Uh, it's a, 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 a view of the future with robots and uh, a futuristic world and abstract um, bizarre um, sets and, and uh, art direction and so forth. Um, that, I would say, if you get a chance, check that one out. I do believe that's on Netflix, um, Instant Q. Um, and you might even get a bit to see um, Faust, which was uh, uh, Merle's uh, film uh, in 1926. Um, I'm looking through here to see a couple others that I would recommend. Um, um, but nonetheless, um, you get a, a sense of the kind of the, not so much the style but the um, elements that you might find in German expressionist sort of um, films. Um, as I said, the movement um, had its a really a uh, catalyst there in World War One, um, and and because of World War One and its effect on the German psyche, there began um, an artistic preoccupation uh, with death and the supernatural. Uh, Germans have always uh, been preoccupied uh, as a people um, with myths. Um, and, um, you know, if you've ever uh, listened to a Wagner opera, it ties into these Norse and Aryan myths of gods and, um, um, and people and, 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 and uh, you know, that the whole kind of pantheon there 
um, of uh, German Nordic um, mythology. Um, but in a sense, there, there's a small kind of a revival, a preoccupation here with death and, and the supernatural. Um, and uh, as Germany was suffering economically, um, uh, they were not able to produce movies that matched what Hollywood was putting out in regards to production value. Um, and so in a sense, they were kind of forced to create their own style um, because they didn't have uh, money to produce big sets. Um, you would see that um, the mezzanine scene that they would use, um, the mood that they would choose, um, the deeper meaning um, that they were striving for, was uh, you were able to achieve that with uh, lower lighting, which means you didn't have to have as amazing sets because they weren't revealing all the sets, or even on location shooting, which in this movie you see a, a, a lot of that used. Um, it's very epic in that sense. It feels different than a movie... Um, from 1922 uh, that you would normally see because Hollywood, a lot of their movies were set, shot on set because you could control lighting, you could control the set, you could control what was going on in, on the screen. If you're working out on location, it is um, you, you have uh, you have to deal with nature. Um, and let's see here, a couple other points here to, to look at in that regard. So uh, the German uh, filmmakers and the studios at that time um, would camouflage their mediocre sets with this unique lighting style. Um, and so the first of these films, they lacked these lavish uh, budgets. Um, and so in that regard, they, there was a temptation to go towards the more absurd or non-realistic sort of set to, to make up for that. And in that regard, uh, a lot of people believe that those are some of the elements that help produce this particularly unique style of, of filmmaking. Um, um, often, these movies did deal with dark, moody, um, almost horror filmmaking. Um, and uh, it would eventually uh, catch on um, in Hollywood. There was an interest in these sort of movies, um, and uh, of all studios, Universal actually picked up on this theme, and in the early 30s began to produce Dracula and Frankenstein and uh, the, weir uh, the uh, Wolfman and so forth, which became very popular um, a movie, a very popular movie genre, the horror movie genre. Um, but you could really say that this goes back to these um, German um, expressionism uh, films of the 20s. Um, a final note on our director. Uh, he uh, did not resist the allure of Hollywood. Um, after, I think it was about 1926, 27, he was back into Hollywood. He made two movies while he was here. Sunshine, or Sunrise, sorry, uh, was one that he made... Um, and actually won some Academy Awards at the very first Academy Award ceremony, which I believe was in 28 or 29. Um, and unfortunately, as he was working on uh, some other movie projects, um, died in a car accident in Santa Barbara, of all places. Uh, so we almost have a California connection here in that regards. He was buried uh, back in Berlin, um, but at the age of 42, um, died. So it would have been really interesting. He was trying to transition into... The uh, sound era, the talkie film era, um, and that's why he hadn't really developed as much there from about 28, 29 to when he died in 31. Um, but it would have been interesting to see if he'd lived another 10, 20, 30, I mean 42, it's so young, he could have lived another 50 years uh, to see what he could have done uh, with his vision and his art form. But nonetheless, what we have um, is what we have. And today, uh, or this week, you will get to watch Nosferatu. Um, and see this very unique, um, stylistic, and I think entertaining movie. Um, and I hope you do do enjoy it there. Let me wrap up with a couple of housekeeping issues here. Um, as I said, the, the film is on Netflix, and it is on what I call the instant queue. You can literally hit play and watch it right there. I encourage you, when you look it up, there's several, there's two or three other DVDs that I saw on Netflix with the name Nosferatu. Make sure you watch the original version. It's literally called that Nosferatu colon original version. Um, the sound on that, the score, is something that's somewhat new. Um, and they say is inspired by the original score. I don't think it is the original score. 
um, but nonetheless, it, it will get you through. Um, uh, there are a couple of uh, writing prompts that I, I want you to look at. Um, let me explain real quick here. Writing prompt for Nosferatu. Um, an important feature of Nosferatu's art direction is the decision to use genuine landscape rather than studio-built sets. Discuss how this adds to the overall mood of the film. How did the work of German romantic painter Caspar David um, Friedrich um, influence Marau's vision? Find one scene that might be influenced by Friedrich and explain the similarities. Then explain how the scene adds to the overall mood of the movie. I think you should understand what I'm talking about here. Uh, after you read her, after you've lifted, listened a bit to this, you know, the lighting, uh, the styles, the sets, the way it's put together, uh, the mood, how the movie makes you feel. Uh, so how, do, how, how does particularly uh, Friedrich's uh, sort of vision uh, make you feel when it comes to these, um, uh, when it comes to the mood and the style uh, of this movie, um, and the fact that a lot of this was shot on location, how does that contribute um, to the overall, uh, you know, the landscape? How does that contribute to the overall mood there? So, I hope I explained that uh, somewhat well there. I, I, I feel that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the other prompt in regards to chapter six is that um, uh, Dalvecchi writes on page 167 that the expressionist movement oscillates between the macabre and the lyrical that is typical of the romantic experience. What do you, what do you think this means? Um, so you need to read the chapter there, look at that section particularly. How, and how is this concept reflected in the film? And I want you to find two scenes in the movie that reflect this uh, reality. So I'm not expecting you to go and do any massive amounts of research. What I want you to do is really just take this um, at its core. Um, if romanticism is about imagination and about experience and about nature and so forth um, and uh, moving away from reason, uh, and I'm not saying that towards absurd right away, but away, f away from reason, um, let me give you an example. Early on in the movie, in fact, early, the first scene here, we see... Um, the um, husband brings some flowers, and that's lyrical, isn't it? It's it's a, it's a nice opening scene. the The wife is playing with the kitten. The husband is out in the garden. He's collecting flowers. He comes in. It's wonderful. But then she goes, "Oh, you killed the flowers." I would say that's a bit macabre, isn't it? That's a little bit dealing with death there. Um, and so, how how is that? Uh, you know, that that's how it's reflected. In, in the movie there. Uh, think a little bit more about that. Develop that thought a little bit more. Um, and I look forward to reading your responses. Um, the discussion, um, I've already touched upon that. Um, so I want you to look at uh, the difference between a very ugly vampire versus very attractive vampires, which we are more used to. Um, and then finally, the journal. I want you to look at um, the use of high and low angles um, shots, which he does use in this movie. Uh, what does a high angle shot communicate? What does a low angle shot communicate? Um, how are they used? How does it contribute to the overall mood uh, of this particular um, movie? Um, and then finally, regarding your term paper, I think most of you have sent me a movie and kind of uh, uh, an, an artist or a an artistic genre or a movement that has in, that it, you're going to be looking at the influence that it has had on that particular movie. Um, if you haven't, please send it to me so I can give you some input. If you need further development, email me and I'll help you develop that. I've been giving a lot of you, I hope, decent input in, in that regards. Um, and I think that wraps it all up here. Next week I will have a uh, study guide for the uh, final um, uh, posted for you to look at. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. Last week, I do apologize, there was a, a, a couple days there where the, my email was um, intermittent. Um, and uh, it, w it would work sometimes, and sometimes it didn't work. And I, I believe there was a problem on campus there. So um, I f if you haven't heard from me in a couple of days, shoot me another email. Um, it's typically more of an IT issue than it would be that I am ignoring your um, your email because I try to get back to you as, as soon as I can. Um, and uh, thank you so much. We are almost through, if you can believe it. After this week, we will just have to, well, technically we have three more weeks here. So um, stay on top of your work. Um, if you have any questions, please email me, and I really appreciate your time. All right, now go watch that movie, pop some popcorn, and have some fun. Take care.